welcome, welcome everybody. Start putting the agenda in the chat. Um, and it has a section for adding your name and affiliation. So if you wanna go ahead and start adding um, yourself into notes, that'd be awesome. Hey, everybody. Stephanie, hi. Uh -huh. Welcome everybody. For those of you that are just joining, I'm going to do that thing where we keep adding the Google Doc link here, but um, this is a link to our agenda and shared notes. And if you want to add yourself um, and the attendees, that would be awesome. And we will give people just another couple of minutes to get started. Give people about two more minutes before Maria kicks us off. Um, so one more time. And can people hear? Please quiet. Mm -hmm. Um Hi, Sean. Jane is here. Great to see folks in the agenda. So I've just been chatting the agenda link. Um, welcome to those of you that just joined. Um, we are um, right on the first page, sort of heading into the second page, um, adding uh, your name and affiliation, where you're calling, where you're Zooming in from, um, and connection to project if you want to add that. Um, and we will get started in just a minute. Um, okay, so I think Maria, when you're whenever you're ready, we can go ahead and kick it off. All right, thank you, Erin. And Hello to everyone and welcome. Thanks so much for joining us today and good evening, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are joining from in the world today. I see a lot of familiar names and faces here on the call and a few that I may not have had the pleasure of meeting yet. So just wanted to say a few quick words about, about myself and about data site and about the reason for bringing everyone together today. So my name is Maria Gould. I am the director of product at data site. And so I'm here today with the honor and privilege of welcoming everyone to this session and also just saying a few words to uh, to help contextualize what's bringing us all together today. We're very pleased to be kicking off this workshop and dialogue in conjunction with community partners with Metadata Game Changers, who you'll hear from shortly. That's Aaron and Ted and their partner, Jamaica Jones. And also really pleased to have a great lineup of speakers from across the community today to be sharing their experiences and wisdom with all of you. So, uh, just to set the stage a little bit about, about what we're doing here, we've been undertaking a project at Datasite in collaboration with Metadata Game Changers and generously funded by the Richard Lounsbury Foundation to explore different community use cases around projects, which is the focus of this session, and instrument metadata, which was a session that we held a couple of weeks ago. 
So thank you very much to the Richard Lansbury Foundation for supporting this effort. And we're doing this because, as many of you know, uh, our mission at DataSite is connecting research and advancing knowledge. And we do this as a global community of research organizations united by a shared objective to pursue infrastructure and solutions to support the identification and connection of all research outputs and resources for the benefit of the world and to make it possible for information about these resources and outputs to be reused and discovered and connected and uh, impact in, impacted in many different ways. So research processes and research practices are constantly in evolution. And at DataSite, we are trying to keep up with that at the same time. From the product side, that means that we're constantly trying to understand what are the use cases and needs that are out there across many different research communities. And what does that mean in terms of the services and infrastructure that we might build and, and support at DataSite to make it possible for those, for those use cases to be better supported. So a lot of what we do uh, at, at the heart of it is supporting core infrastructure to support DOIs and DOI registrations. But I want to emphasize that that means a lot of, a lot of different things. It doesn't just mean one thing. And a lot of what we've been focused on recently is looking at the broad diversity of outputs and resources that can be brought under that umbrella and that can be used by various communities to, to support different kinds of needs and activities. So we're really operating at multiple levels across the community at DataSite to support different ways of, of working with DOIs, but more broadly to support different ways of interacting with metadata about research and really using that to power discovery and insights. So. I just wanted to lay that out in terms of the the big picture of who we are working with at DataSite and some of the some of the layers on which we are we are working. So this dialogue today is really an opportunity to dig a little bit deeper into one slice of this, which is really understanding community use cases around projects and project metadata. And I'm not gonna talk about that today because we have a whole lineup of fantastic speakers who are going to do that. So my job today is really to be here to listen and, and to learn. What we are doing as part of this project with Metadata Game Changers and with the Richard Lounsbury Foundation funding is to pursue uh, a, a really community-driven approach to understanding these use cases, starting with conversations such as the one that we are having today and the one that we had a couple of weeks ago and using these conversations to kickstart new ideation and, and recommendations about things that we might build or better support in the context of data site infrastructure and feed all of those ideas and insights into our iterative and community driven development processes. So we're really looking forward to this discussion and dialogue today to bring all of these insights together and to help power our development work forward in the coming year. So uh, with that, again, I'll just close by thanking all of you for joining, thanking the Metadata Game Changers team for being part of this initiative, thanking all of the speakers who are here to participate in the conversation. And with that, I'll hand it off to Aaron. Awesome, thanks, Maria. Um, so again, I'm Erin Robinson. I work with Ted Haberman at Metadata Game Changers, and we have um, do all kinds of metadata, but we're excited to talk to you today about project metadata. And um, co-facilitating with us is Jamaica Jones, um, who has worked quite closely with Ted on a couple of NSF Eagers um, and has, um, I think, experience in the the, meta, the project metadata land as well. Um, so just to give you a quick orientation of where we're going, and I wonder, uh, Maria, do you want to stop sharing your screen? Um, so I've put the link to the notes in the chat. 
Um, and I will put it here one more time. Um, so as Maria mentioned, this is a dialogue. We called it that on purpose because we really want this to be a participatory um, interactive session. And so our plan for today um, is to give an overview in the first hour, and then we'll break into breakouts, which we hope that you don't leave at that point, um, and um, talk about sort of the initial, like what's what's missing, what are examples of projects in your field, what are the kind of use cases that you might have for project metadata, and then um, we'll come back and wrap it up. So um, I wanted to first ground um, this a bit in, um, the responses, the folks that responded to the survey or to, sorry, to the registration. So we have 27, um, sorry, I'm in, I'm in the right place. Okay, um, so you're seeing my slides. So um, we asked registrants, we had 72 registrants um, at the time that we started the call today. Um, and we asked what best described your primary domain. And so you can see we've got a lot of science coming in, but a lot of different kinds of science, earth science, meteorology, life science, um, a little bit of astronomy, biodiversity, um, computer science. So it's interesting to see the diversity of science coming in. Um, we also ask how you identified um, with the following communities of researcher, librarians, um, and so this was the, the community response. So we have a lot of librarians that were interested, folks working in research infrastructure um, and researchers and data scientists. So I think this is just an interesting, um, another interesting look. And then which of the following described your role? And here, I think it's interesting to see that among the 72, we really had kind of creator and user showing up in equal, um, equal ways. So, you know, take what you will from these word clouds, but um, this was one way that I just wanted to begin to explain um, or show kind of the diversity of folks that are joining us for this uh, session. So I'm going to stop sharing for a minute. And I just wanted to check in with um, the audience before we move into this next section of this landscape. Um, what questions or comments do you have about the process before we get started or want to add? Jamaica, Ted, am I missing anything before we get going? Okay. Um, well, then I'm gonna go back to, oh, the doc, um, please add notes and uh, reactions to the doc as we go. So we're gonna head through this next set of talks, um, which provide a really kind of diverse landscape of where we're seeing project metadata show up across a variety of different communities. Um, so I'll start with some framing. Um, Ted will talk about how data site is, um, how we're seeing projects um, described in data site. Then we'll move to Sean Ross, who has been leading um, the research activity identifier work. We'll then move to Greg Newman, who leads citizen, the citizen science platform, um, talking about how we connect science data and projects. And then we'll finish this, um, quick landscape with local context who has been using um, projects as a way to connect indigenous rights um, and to connect institutions and um, community, local or community, indigenous communities. Um, so please add to the notes as we go. Um, and we'll also have some time for silent Google docking as well. So with that, I'm gonna share my screen again. Um, And so I wanted to quickly ground um, how I came to find project metadata interesting and useful through the work that I've been doing with field stations um, and ground this dialogue in a real world use case for, for all of us. Um, so I primarily work with uh, marine stations and you can see there are about 800 that are noted here on the map. These are scientific facilities all over the world that provide um, you know, lab space um, and housing for researchers who are going out into the field. And the one that I work most closely with is uh, the University of California Gump South Pacific Research Station. It was established in the 80s. It has a major project, the Morea Coral Reef Long-Term Ecological Research Project. Um, and you can see here, um, this bottom picture gives you a sense of the kind of facility. So it has boats and um, workspace along the, the water. 
as well as across the street, it has classrooms um, and additional lab space, and they also have housing. So um, to give us a sense of kind of the work, I wanted to provide a little bit of background. Um, we've used this case study, the Morea Biocode Project, which started in 2007 and ran to 2010. And it's interesting for a couple of reasons. And one of those is because it happened a long enough time ago that it has related works that have been produced about it. And it gives us this kind of interesting project to look back on, but also try new kinds of um, project infrastructure. And so the current way that the project was described is in this RAM system that the UC field stations use. That's for reservations, applications, management system. And here you can see the biocode project described. And the strengths of the system are that it's an archive for past projects. It has an established user management system. And it gives us this project application workflow, but its weaknesses were that it was a closed system, it didn't use identifiers, and it's disconnected from downstream work. So when we um, connected with the field stations to work with them on this project, their main complaint was that people come and they use the field station, but then they leave and it's not clear what's happened um, with the samples or the data that they take. And so we see this showing up in things like this collecting event that happened. They um, broke it into its individual specimens and created genetic sequences, which are then um, captured in NCBI, which is a, a repository for genetic data. The physical specimens go to many different um, institutions, museums, repositories, and uh, university labs. Some of the metadata for those specimens is shared with the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, or GBIF, but what we're not say seeing is any connections back to place here. And this leads to this contextual collapse where downstream reusers of scientific data have no idea if it's ethical, legal, or the social constraints on it. Um, Place-based communities um, like local indigenous communities miss out on knowledge that could inform stewardship or stimulate future research. Um, and field stations fail to receive the credit and recognition for their contributions, undermining their capacity to support future work. And so we've leveraged the open science infrastructure to help to solve this problem. And we've done that through publishing projects through DataCite with ORCID um, and, and the connecting people and organizations and um, with local context, the rights um, through, um, through this approach. And what we get from using DataCite is that here we see this is the project um, landing page and it connects to the field station. So we're getting that connection back to place. And then on the data site commons page for the field station, we can start to see the projects over time and we can see that those works being connected. And so all in all, this gives us this ability to connect place to planet through the PID graph. And so I've explained a little bit of how the talks are gonna go next, but I'm gonna turn it over to, uh, to Ted next to talk about um, projects more generally in data site. So stop sharing um, and Ted, take it away and you'll have seven minutes and I'll let you know when the time is. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yep, uh, we can hear uh, Yes, great, okay. Yeah, so I wanted to talk a little bit about how projects are, are currently uh, described in data site. There are uh, almost 100,000. Actually, Eric uh, is here from Center for Open Science, which is the home of many of those. But um, this is the, the final picture that Aaron uh, showed, <clears throat> sort of an initial draft that we did a while ago, and projects are, are, are an important point or an important node in this uh, connected network of things. And, you know, one of the goals of this group uh, every everyone that's talking about projects uh, shares the the belief that that they're about making connections and connections to a number of different things, and that's why we uh, we're using exploring the use of data site because it's a great connector, um, and some of these things exist: researchers, data sets, publications, organizations. Some of these things are things that we're thinking about in terms of. Uh, the field stations that Eric, uh, sorry, that Aaron was just talking about, permits, notices, uh, Jane will talk about a little bit later. So we're trying to build this connected uh, connected network of, of people, organizations, funders, uh, and, and uh, research objects. 
in uh, data site, there's roughly 42 repositories uh, that currently have project metadata or had it uh, as of about a month ago when I collected this data. And this is uh, the, the number of those repositories. So 42 is the maximum or for the 42 uh, repositories and they focus um, or they, they all have the mandatory fields and also uh, uh, resource type here because that's what I use to select these. So the, the mandatory fields are complete and then fields that are uh, other fields in data site sort of fall off uh, in number as we look at those other different fields. So the the green and the yellow are sort of the special uh, special fields that are important for connecting, uh, connecting things, identifying things and then connecting them. So the green ones are uh, author identifiers or ORCIDs, uh, affiliations or ROARs, uh, then award numbers and funder identifiers are out here sort of on, in, in the smaller numbers. And then the kinds of connections uh, that exist are the sort of orange or yellowish uh, things. And we can see that they're still uh, pretty low uh, in terms of the number of repositories that provide that kind of metadata for projects. So as Aaron mentioned, you know, what were the, the purpose of this, of this dialogue or this community that we're trying to build is, is to figure out which of those uh, identifiers or, or how mostly how we use those connections. So I wanted to show an example. Maybe it's interesting, a small step. Uh, these are the projects that uh, uh, Metadata Game Changers has been involved with. And um, the projects are purple. I think there's nine or 10 of them here. And I wanted to show this slide because it sort of shows the, the diversity of the connections that we might uh, that we might make and, and, and the diversity of the kinds of projects. Uh, this, this project up here in the upper right uh, is a research uh, coordination network, which is a, a kind of NSF project, which involves building communities and bringing communities together. Uh, this is a research communication or uh, research uh, coordination network, which is uh, about samples. So these are people, and then that, that project has these sort of uh, yellowish things that you can see. Uh, and these are uh, events. So events are another um, uh, resource type in data site. And the resource, RCNs, research uh, coordination networks are, are things that bring together uh, you know, groups and workshops and different kinds of things. So that's why this project over here has so many people. Then we have other projects that involve a lot of uh, fewer people, but a lot of uh, connected resources. So anyway, uh, this is the beginning uh, of, of what we're trying to do. And, and a total in this group, uh, a total number of things, 10 projects, 137 people, um, five different funders, 17 organizations, and then the relation types are the ones that we're you know, exploring for, for connecting these things together. Um, and and this is uh, uh, you know really sort of uh, the, the current state of, of our thinking and we're uh, we're happy to uh, we're excited to talk to others and, and get other ideas of how we might do these things. And uh, that's uh, the last slide. So I'm gonna awesome. stop sharing. Thanks, Ted. Mm -hmm. And while we trans transition to Sean, uh, Ellie had one quick question in the chat and asked if this was a Neo4j database. Uh, it is. Although, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say that I'm a very good Neo4j database person, but anyway, I, um, I'm, I'm getting better at making pictures. Um. Awesome. Thanks, Ellie, for the question. Thanks, Ted, for the framing. Um, and um, I did, I also uh, put a link to the materials. All the slides are in the materials folder, and I put a link to Ted's um, slides specifically as well. Um, so next up, we have Sean Ross from ARDC. 
talking to us about RAID's use case. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear yes, you great. great. Uh, let me uh, just uh, share my screen then. See if that worked. Um, so uh, my name is Sean Ross, and I'm the uh, uh, product manager for uh, RAID at the Australian Research Data Commons. Um, and I'll just uh, say just a very quick thing about the ARDC for anyone who might not be uh, familiar with it. Uh, we're essentially the uh, leading research uh, technology, uh, research data support organization in Australia. Um, and uh, we have a, a portfolio of uh, identifier services, um, including the research activity identifier, where we are the um, uh, global registration authority under the ISO standard that governs that and the primary developers of the software that uh, drives it. So just very quickly, um, I, I'm not quite sure what the level of uh, familiarity with uh, with RAID is, so I thought I'd do just a quick uh, um, an introduction to it. Uh, so RAID, it's, it, it is a persistent identifier for projects, but it's more than that. Uh, the, um, the product that we're developing is also uh, intended to be a global project uh, registry and a collaborative metadata management system for research projects and activities um, where we're uh, linking organizations, people, inputs, outputs to a project. Uh, where, as I mentioned before, we're governed by an ISO standard, uh, and I have the link here, um, with the ARDC as a global uh, registration authority. And uh, our first uh, overseas uh, registration agency is SURF in the Netherlands. Um, we, the, we, the ARDC, acts as registration agency for Australia and New Zealand, and we're in discussions with uh, um, about half a dozen other organizations to expand that. Um, we do have mechanisms in place now if you're not in europe or australia new zealand you can still get raids uh if you if you want i can answer questions about that towards the uh towards the end uh and the ardc and data site are partnering to deliver the raid service and i'll explain that briefly in just a, uh just a minute so i did I'll, I'll i'll update i'll upload a new copy of my slides because just seeing the uh um, the introduction and the earlier one i dropped in an extra slide from another a couple of extra slides from another presentation. So um, uh, RAID, uh, the ARDC and DataCite are developing this uh, uh, in, in um, are, are partnering to deliver, um, uh, to deliver RAID. There's some specific things about uh, RAID, though, that I would point out that uh, differentiate us from uh, a, 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 a standard uh, data site project ID. Um, one, we've got our customized metadata schema, which I'll, I'll just talk more about later. Uh, but also, um, uh, one of the things that sort of that jumped to mind when the RAM system was mentioned, we are in the late stages. We're almost done uh, developing uh, our um, multi uh, multi party administration of the um, uh, of the metadata, the records in uh, RAID. Um, and uh, RAID's definitely de uh, designed the metadata schema and the system that implements it is designed to um, make the recording of the dynamic nature of a project, the changes, the people who come and go, the organizations who come and go, the outputs that emerge as time goes on, uh, to automate that to the extent uh, possible and make it possible to interrogate the history of a project. The other thing that we do, and my, my little screenshot thing didn't work very well, but um, like ORCID, we provide a standardized landing page for every uh, project in the RAID uh, system. And uh, finally, the, the metadata in particular is uh, extensible and customizable by um, individual registration agencies within sort of guardrails that we've established as the registration authority. Um, and we're also cultivating a, um, a a community around the development and support of RAID, exploration of topics like this uh, around uh, around metadata and other aspects of the system. And again, very quickly to um, to uh, uh, give you an idea of the relationship between RAID and and data site. So uh, RAID is a separate system. Uh, we submit when you make a RAID record, uh, it submits a metadata excerpt to data site. So we we're we're part of the or you can uh, visualize a RAID using the tools that uh, that data site has uh, has developed. And we request a DOI. Uh, data site then issues the DOI. The complete metadata and all the user interactions happen in the RAID system. 
uh, well, 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 there's a, um, a partial metadata record uh, available uh, under the uh, RAID registry type. Um, a RAID, is, and I, I'll, I'm happy to answer any questions about this uh, at the end. Um, a RAID is essentially a, a container for other persistent identifiers um, and, and uh, plus a, a small amount of uh, other project metadata that you might not find elsewhere, titles, etc. Uh, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about metadata since that's what we're focusing on. We've uh, divided the metadata into core, extended, and, 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 and local blocks, uh, or sorry, uh, so sections of metadata, and within that it's uh, organized in, um, uh, organized in uh, uh, blocks. Um, and these uh, blocks in, include um, uh, groups of related properties, the, uh, the, the schemas that define the controlled lists associated with those. Uh, uh, often, many of the blocks contain uh, start and end dates uh, and uh, a language specification. Um, and we generally follow, and I'll show you in just a moment, uh, but we generally follow the, the pattern that we try to um, express everything as an identifier, or at least if there's no identifier available, some kind of, of, of hopefully persistent uh, URL, uh, something like um, if, if an output of a project or something were a website, we encourage people to at least take an archive.org snapshot of that. We've got some other linked uh, IRI sorts of things that we do that aren't true PIDs, but are uh, hopefully more or less persistent uh, URLs. Um, so we've got this pattern of this is the thing and this is the schema that uh, uh, that define that uh, that the scheme that the thing is part of, um, and we've implemented language uh, attributes throughout. Uh, a typical uh, this is actually probably easier to see on the um, uh, on the uh, in the documentation, but I, I didn't want to risk taking out going out to the website for that during a, a short presentation like this. But to give you a, a, a taste of what kind of what we've done, we, we started by looking at the data site metadata schema and a number of other schema, schema.org, a, a, a number of other um, a, a number of other uh, uh, schemas that define projects. Uh, and <clears throat> we've what we've done is develop something that we think it's quite um, specific to or customized for uh, projects. Uh, and I won't go through this, you know, every single, uh, you know, every single field, but maybe I'll point out a few differences and, and explain a, a couple of things that we've done. Uh, we've got an identifier block uh, that has the identifier, the RAID identifier itself and a declaration that it's a RAID. Um, we've got some things hey, that Sean. reflect. Oh, yep. Yeah. Just about 30 seconds left. Oh, 30 seconds. Ah, I set my timer a little bit too long. Um, Title, uh, we've got, uh, so information about the uh, identifier itself, uh, start and end dates for the overall project. And then we do things like title and description. And what we do here is allow multiple titles with a type of the title and multiple descriptions with the type of descriptions. We've separated out people, contributors, and organizations. Um, and we have done uh, related uh, inputs and outputs as related objects with a type input output or internal process document and a category that's largely based on the data site controlled list um, these identifiers or sorry these uh, properties were identified through uh, some extensive business analysis and interviews at the start of uh, RAID. Um, and I guess uh, considering the audience, we uh, allow extended uh, metadata properties allow customization at the registration agency level. And we do things like subject, and that'll vary from region to region, spatial coverage. Uh, and we believe we've uh, hopefully uh, implemented the local context labels and notices in a way that uh, uh, that local context likes. So. Um, uh, that's a general idea. I've given provided some links, uh, and you're happy. I'm uh, happy for you to contact um, me or uh, the generic contact at ARDC to uh, learn more about RAID. So thank you, everyone. Awesome. Thanks so much, Sean. And we know that these are these are tough in the sh short lightning mode, but um, I think people are adding questions um, and notes in the chat, and then we'll come back to. Um, some of that follow-up as well. 
Um, so to just keep us moving. Um, next up, we have Greg Newman. Um, and I met Greg this summer and he was sharing the citizen science platform that he, um, he leads and develops. And one of the things that caught my eye was projects, um, which I think may have been a little, maybe he thought that was a little strange, but um, I will turn it over to Greg. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. And thanks for these fantastic talks. Already learning a lot. Um, I'll share my screen and I'll try to uh, keep on time to the best of my ability. It's always tricky, but uh, here yep. we go. I'll um, let you know and when we're yeah, no right worries. at time and then you'll have a little buffer. Yep. Awesome. And I don't know why this didn't do a full screen. <clears throat> can you guys see that okay? <clears throat> yep. We Delightful. Can. So I'm just going to talk about, so I am not a metadata expert. I am not a library scientist and I am not a data scientist per se, but I'm a bit of a entrepreneur of sorts who really as an ecologist in training wanted to support and continue to have as my mission to support community-based engaged scholarship, community-led, community-driven research, and wanted to support community-led initiatives. And of course, in doing so, we see a ton of initiatives get started and we of course want to document them in proper ways. So I'm here to learn, um, but I'll also share what we're up to. And with this in mind, today we're trying to advance cyber infrastructure solutions with the help of data site and metadata game changers to identify, describe, discover, and track the impact of instruments and projects. And so for me, this is fun because at the heart of what we like to do is keep track of who's doing what where. And metadata will help us do that, right? And so my space is in participatory science, which goes under many names, citizen science, community-based monitoring, participatory action research, um, engaged scholarship, crowdsourcing, et cetera. And so when we look at these initiatives, these are initiatives by, for, and with the people. And so these are science initiatives that are collaborations between scientists like myself as an ecologist and, and members of the public, right, um, wherever they may be, studying whatever heterogeneous topics may and phenomena that may be of interest to them. And so what we've done is we've built and built out a, a you know, cloud-hosted API-based um, open science platform and, and associated mobile apps to support these initiatives. And that comes in the flavor of sitsci.org. And I'll give you a quick SITSI 101, and then we'll talk about metadata. So what SITSI is, is a, a cloud-hosted solution for community science and participatory science efforts. And we've amassed over 2.1 million observations and measurements of the natural world um, with the help of community-engaged researchers with the mission of supporting these participatory science projects worldwide so they can address community needs. We offer tools and platforms and apps to help them develop and co-create projects and amplify outcomes. And it's the amplify outcomes that's relevant in the metadata space because we don't want this work to be siloed and not have amplified impacts and outcomes for advancing other um, derivative, derivative science. And so our goals are threefold. One, to support the full spectrum of participatory science needs. Two, elevate the rigor of participatory science data. And three, relevant to today, improve data standardization, interoperability, integration, access, and sharing with the respect of governance needed for you know, local context, which you'll hear about more in a bit as far as um, privacy, governance, um, sovereignty, et cetera. And so the platform offers key manage management features. I'll point out three, our project creator in the upper left, you can build, cr create your own project. It's a DIY platform. And then I'll point out the third to the left, the, the data sheet creator, which I'll talk about. And then you can of course manage governance and members and privacy and, and upload data in bulk and all the things. And of course, participants can do this on their smartphone, their desktop, their tablet. Um, they can dynamically view and interact and learn from the scientific data through, data through visualizations of these data and charts and maps and discuss these data in forums, et cetera. Um, and so what we get is projects, right? And we get, and that's what we're talking about today is when we're trying, we're learning from you, how to document these projects, right? And so um, you can search for these projects. We have a project finder. And of course we have a platform in which people self-describe these projects. It's a DIY based platform and they fill out metadata. Yay, they fill out information about their project, right? And so this is our golden opportunity to capture and yet be it bear in mind, we don't want to be barriers to entry, right? So if we had a James Nitschner, Mitchner novel of information, we might lose some opportunities for engagement. So we have to kind of balance 
ease and, and use and engagement and encouragement to participate with the need to kind of get that self-described information that's so important. Same for our data sheets and which are these, you know, think survey one, two, three, Google Forms. We have a data sheet creator where you slide over your dropdown en entries, your numbers, your numeric date time, images, all the things, and then you specify your options. And this is creating a form in which participants as, as participatory scientists submit data to projects like this. And of course we have a landing page for every one of these projects. And then the data come in like this, where you get observations and photographic evidence and ecological measurements of dissolved oxygen and total dissolved solids and air quality and particulates and soil and uh, mask wearing behavior during COVID and everything under the sun. And I'll give you some uh, array of examples in a second. And, and then of course, people discuss the scientific data being submitted through these forums, submit photos and discuss the, the observations made through these forums, much like on Zooniverse Talk, if you're familiar, familiar with the Zooniverse. And then, of course, like I mentioned, the real-time charts are automatically occur. These are out of real-time updated in real time to look at trends over time at particular locations of phenomena being measured by, for, and with communities. Um, that can be categorical. It can be numeric. We still want to look at trends. These are bald eagle behaviors at nests over time at a particular nest. What it, inquiring minds want to know what climate change is doing on those bald eagle behaviors. Similarly, we might look at nest status condition, what percent, get dynamically generated pie charts, et cetera. And this is all with a very science communication forward mentality because we're dealing with the public. We are not dealing with machine readable Python scripts, which we love and, and that's great, but the public wants to know the storytelling behind these very impactful, meaningful place-based research projects. And so a quick examples, I know um, Aaron wanted to hear about use cases and example projects. So I've got 10 of them. I will fly through them faster than we can breathe. But um, the Perennial Atlas is bought, brought to you by the Land Institute in Salina, Kansas. And they've engaged a, a wealth of growers willing to grow perennial grains for regenerative ag across the country in mass and study emergence and phenology and disease resistance and, and you know seed production, et cetera, to bring these to market for regenerative agricultural and, and soil carbon solutions. Um, the Bald Eagle Watch Project here in Colorado um, is covering a gap that our Colorado Parks and Wildlife could not reach with paid staff to measure all 287 nests of nesting bald eagles statewide and uh, of course amassing the single best most canonical source of information about the well-being of eagles in the rockies mm -hmm. leave Greg, no trace just about 30 seconds perfect thank you yep. leave no trace has multiple projects the leave no trash project uh, a, a town is monitoring wildlife um, here in Colorado. And then we've engaged in crowdsourcing campaign, everybody looking for crazy microorganisms that might fix carbon because of their extreme nature that they're found in, in humidifiers, et cetera. And then we've got 3D printed fly traps, engaging people to collect flies and study viro virology, uh, mass monitoring of stream flow with NASA's support, and another leave no trace example. And then finally a mountain goat tracking pr project, which capitalized on our integration with the Zooniverse platform to lead to some novel science. And so I just wanna lead and end with the last few slides saying that at the end of the day, we need better tracking of these project impacts, whether they be scientific, participant, conservation or decision policy impacts. And of course, to do that, we need standardized metadata, right? And metadata sharing. And so I'll finalize and conclude with this data kind of co-created grassroots um, part public participation in scientific research metadata standard that we've been working on, which has a project metadata model, an observation data model, and a data set metadata model. And we're just learning um, from data site and metadata game changers on how to do this. We have, of course, I, you know, ERDs, and we draw on Darwin core terms um, to map our uh, models to those. So with that, I'll close. I think I made it, Erin, um, barely. You made <laughs> it. You made it. Thanks so much. This was a super interesting talk, and I loved seeing those examples. Um, and I think we'll just lead right into our last talk in this um, section is from Local Context, which we've heard, I think, all of the groups mention. Um, and we have Jane Anderson, who founded Local Context, and Stephanie Runninghawk-Johnson, the executive director 
founding executive director here to um, talk to us about local context and projects. Yes, thank you. I'm going to do the speed version of uh, of local context, who we are, what we do, and Jane's going to jump in and talk um, more specifically about the metadata pieces of things. So I am going to attempt to share my screen here for you all. All right, there we go. Um, sorry, I'm moving things around a little bit so I can see everybody. All right, so we are local context, like um, like Aaron said, you've heard heard our name a couple of times now. Um, and so we um, we were really created, Jane. You're you're really lucky you have Jane here because Jane is the um, one of the founders of Local Context. She came up with this beautiful idea of trying to think about how to keep Indigenous communities connected to and in charge of having a say in um, having authority over their. Um, uh, cultural heritage items, but also their data. And of course, with that comes their metadata as well. And so in that process, we have created um, some traditional knowledge labels, some uh, notices as well. I'll tell you a little bit about the difference between those um, those two here in a second. And we also have biocultural notices and labels, which I think for this group might be um, a bit more of, of what you're all interested in. Um, but we have a lot of connections. We're really, really global. So we have connections with communities, with institutions, and with researchers all across the globe. We have 820 people at this point using the hub that we have. That is our website where people create projects and apply notices and labels. Um, and you can see on the map there with those little red dots, we have a strong presence here in Turtle Island or North America, as well as Aotearoa, New Zealand. But we are also growing um, all over the globe, which I think is, is really, really exciting. Um, so, so local context really is is about thinking through how can we uh, keep indigenous communities connected to their data and their information and their cultural heritage items. And so, um, every community has collections of of both tangible and intangible knowledge and data that's being held um, outside of their communities in you know libraries, museums, in uh, institutions such as uh, universities and other data databases and repositories. And so um, how do we make sure that those communities maintain a connection to their information? How do we make sure that that information is correct? Um, and how do we make sure that Indigenous communities have authority over their, their items and their, their information, their data, their, their um, metadata as well? Um, and so we, you know, we think about if, if we have lots of researchers working and collecting data that comes from Indigenous homelands, um, how is that being done and, and how are we making sure that those communities have a say over what happens to that information? Um, so one way that we have come together and, and put together as a way to do that is through our traditional knowledge and biocultural labels, as well as notices. Um, the labels are applied by Indigenous communities, then they really reinforce the rights of those communities when we're thinking about that information. Really want to make sure that um, that information is connected to the community that it came from, as well as making sure that the community has a say over how that information or that data is used, accessed, and circulated. Um, we also have these notices, which are for use by institutions and researchers. And really the idea here is for researchers and institutions to make sure that they are disclosing that they have indigenous information within their databases, within their collections, within their archives, within whichever space we might be talking about. Um, and, and like I just said, we really feel like the institutions and researchers have this responsibility to really disclose that information. And um, we have disclosure notices, we have engagement notices, and we have collections care notices. I would explain those if I had a little more time. If you're curious, I'm happy to have that conversation with you. Um, as you can see, these are the three different kinds of notices that they that we have. Um, each one has an icon, and that icon is consistent always in every single use. So you, when you see one or when a machine reads one, they are always the same and easy to recognize. 
Um, we also say that communities have an opportunity to add their labels to their information. Um, and we have all sorts of, of labels. We have quite a few more of these. As you can see, we have provenance labels, we have protocol labels, and we have permissions labels. Um, and again, would love to chat with you more about individual ones of, of what these look like and what they're applied for and how we use them, how communities use them. Um, but I am going to go ahead and turn this over to Jane to tell you a little bit more about the hub and the, the metadata pieces here that are probably what you all are a little more excited about. So Jane, over to you. Thanks so much, Stephanie, and it's lovely to be here. Um, I do apologize if there's screaming in the background, it will be the children and I won't be able to do much about it, but um, let's see. So Stephanie has been able to talk a little bit about the, um, the what and the why um, that we developed local context for. I'm going to talk a little bit about the how. And um, this is probably the, the biggest thing that we built. Uh, nothing like this had been ever built before um, in order to connect communities to projects, to metadata across various different kinds of data systems. So this took many years to build. Um, and I have to say, I've been using it myself for my own projects and it works quite well. Um, in fact, it works really well. Our system isn't really the problem. It's kind of moving it into um, other spaces, uh, which tends to be the, the more challenge. So we developed a hub and the hub is kind of really where you go in, you create your researcher uh, profile, or if you're a community, you, com you create your community account, or if you're an institution, you create an institutional account. Uh, if you wanna to go to the next slide, Stephanie. And when you're in there, um, you're able to create a project. And I wanna just give a shout out to John Deck, to Deanna Levette and to Ashley Rojas, who I know is also on this call for all the development work that we've done to, to build this system and for it to be um, quite intuitive to use. So I've just got an image of my, um, my profile in here uh, and just kind of giving you a sense that it, when you go to projects, it's one of the first things that you click on. Um, I will show you what it, what it looks like to create a project, but then when you're on this projects page, it will just list all the projects that you're a part of. Um, so you've kind of got that uh, profile registry that can, you can see what you're doing and then you can go into them as you need. So next slide, Stephanie. So this is what happens when you press, you, when you press that create a profile button. Um, oh, sorry, create a project button. Um, and you will choose as a researcher what, uh, or an institution, you only have access to notices and you can choose uh, the notices that you would like to use on a project. And then you go down and you start adding the project information. Um, so what can a project be? Well, a project can be almost anything. It can range from an expedition to a publication, but it can also range because it has to be used across all these different kinds of cultural contexts that we're, we're talking about. Um, so a project can also be an application on a phone. It can be a medicine walk. It can be a policy document. It can be a thesis. It can be anything that needs to have. It can be a syllabus. It can be anything that needs to have a notice or a label or you're working with a community on, that's what it can be um, in our system. But here's the kind of information that starts to be really important is the um, optional project information. So uh, this is where you add if there is a website or if there is a DOI or if there's a GUID, this allows you to add that information into the project because we're collecting information in relationship to the project. Um, We've just created a feature which allows uh, for a project boundary. This is really particularly important for our um, communities that really want to uh, demarcate their lands according to their own self-determining forms of governance and decision-making rather than necessarily relying upon the nation state, which would really like to define what Indigenous lands are. So that's a new feature that we've developed um, out of the requests from communities. And then you just create the project. And once the project is created, if you can go to the next slide, Stephanie, hey, it kind of gives, yes, like 30 seconds ish. Yep. And then we still um, have time gives, for the video. Yep. Yep. Um, it gives you all this information. So everything that you've put in uh, is here. Next slide, Stephanie. And this is probably the most important. This will give you the, the local context project ID or the project URL. This is what you put into the other system that will always trace back to local context and will also always display this project. And if you can go to the next slide, Stephanie, which I think is my last slide, 
and it will always display the labels or the notices that are associated with that project. So the project that I was showing you is from a project in Ecuador uh, with the Sarayaku community. Uh, they have created 12 labels for their project around uh, an expedition around fungi uh, with a number of collaborators. Uh, and so that project ID will always track back to this project in local context. So we have that as a reference. And even if the labels change on that project, it will always update through our API. So I'll finish there. Awesome. Do you want me to give you a, a quick intro to the into, Let's do it, yeah. Into the, yeah, a quick intro to the video. Um, okay, so it closes us you go. out. Yeah, well, just one quick thing. So I introduced at the beginning this Morea Biocode 1.0 project, and Jane is now going to enter, was going to close us out with uh, how the Biocode project has been connected to local context. Okay, Jane, you go. Okay, okay. So just quickly, um, we wanted to really show how uh, the the project ID and the notices and the labels crosswalk across different systems. And so as we were doing this work in Washington, D.C., um, I, I can't remember when, but at some point, May, I think, we, we kind of screen recorded what we were doing so you can kind of see how easy it is for the labels and the notices to go onto specimens and also uh, for the project ID to be tracked across. So maybe we'll just play the video. All right, I'm gonna hit play. Let's see what happens. Oh, that's not the right. <laughs> Just go to the hey. next slide. Yep, yeah, go back. It doesn't wanna go back. go back. Oh, there we go. I think we may not have sound, but sound isn't essential for this. It's okay. So here we're seeing the Gump Institution. This is the field station. We've created the project and we're now adding these notices um, and including the French translation since we're in French Polynesia. And we're also working to mm -hmm. add Tahitian translations. And so I think what we would like here is dynamic um, filling out of this form, I think, to come back to what Greg was saying, you know, we want to have sort of this to be as easy as possible for researchers and for them not to have to do this multiple times. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of good fields here for us to make these connections between the two systems. You want to press the button? Yeah, sure. Signing it in the Smithsonian. You guys ready? Signing it in the Smithsonian. Here we go. Five, four, three, two, one. Live, baby. Live. Okay. So now we see we've got a Morea Biocode 1.0 project. So then this gives us a project URL. Sean, is this what you're going to need to take to Geo? Yeah. Okay. So now it's your turn. And so now we're taking this ID, Begun. we're adding it to another system. Yay. So here are the some of the samples from one of the teams um, on the BioCode project. And then now we also see when we look at any of these samples that they now have inherited the notices. It could have a traditional knowledge interest, it could have biocultural interest, and the attribution is incomplete.
And so here we're moving to a third system and we're really taking the time here in this particular session, this dialogue to show this because this is showing how project metadata is going from system to system to system. So from local context to geome to now we're in eye samples and we're seeing the notices there show up. We're looking for our community. This is the Atatia Center community page. So our contact for them got an email. So that's the end. Stephanie. Jane, did you have anything else you wanted to add? No, no, no. <laughs> it's a really big deal. I think that um, it's cool to have seen these individual, um, you know, individual project descriptions, but I think what um, came through in this last piece was showing how we can connect these systems together. Um, we're getting some uh, some sweet chats uh, from Greg and John Chidaki about really liking the ability to see this end-to-end -end use case. Um, so I'm going to stick the notes um, doc and we have a place we'll take just a couple of minutes to just quickly jot some thoughts down about things that stick out to you. So here are the notes um, I can get. Um, do -do -do. Um, and we are on the top of page four. You can take just 30 seconds to um, jot some reactions to this landscape. Um, know that some people will have to drop, um, but we wanna make sure that we get some of your thoughts quickly. Um, and then we'll have just a couple of minutes for, um, if you wanna speak something out loud, um, thoughts, reactions, questions before we move into the breakouts. Maybe if anybody have something they want to share as a reaction from the talk. Aaron, I, I do. I, I really appreciated yeah. the uh, local context video um, and the interconnectivity of systems and lack of time let me kind of not share this, uh, I'd call it a success story, but so like I mentioned at the tail end of my talk, a, a team of citizen science platform developers got together to kind of handshake a rudimentary community-based, community, bottom-up driven metadata standard that's not very formal yet, but um, we did so because we wanted to make inter system interoperability possible. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> the story goes and the use case is that a project coordinator creates a project and becomes the project manager on SITSI and engages members of the public to monitor bats, let's say, and they do so. And they use the platform tools to do so. And But they want to recruit more participants to get more monitoring of more bats in their region so that they want to share their metadata and broadcast it far and wide through the SciStarter.org network. I'll put this in the link. SciStarter is, think of it as a phone directory for citizen science projects. It's like the Google 
one-stop shop for participatory science projects. And so they have great connections with like Discover Magazine and Science Friday and NPR. So they have a megaphone <clears throat> for marketing for projects and recruitment. We don't do that work. We just host the data, right? And so what we've done is we've used a metadata handshake to have save the person the pain and the a headache of entering metadata in SITSI and then entering it all over again in SciStarter, right? And so they fill out their project metadata on SITSI, but then they say, share this with SciStarter. It's an opt-in mm -hmm. basis or an opt-out, choose they choose. But if they wish, we'll happily share the, met the metadata on SciStarter, and then it'll automatically be advertised on SciStarter.org. A similar vein is done with the Zooniverse. We've got an integration that platform focuses on image classification tasks. So a set of different set of volunteers log in and classify images like for the camera traps and whatnot. So we might have a sit side project, but then we wanna create a corollary entry for that same project. And so we're using these persistent identifiers to keep track of the project on different platforms. So I wanted to share that because the video illustrated a similar mm -hmm. use case. Yeah, that's great to know. Um, any other quick comments? Anything people are seeing sticking out in the notes? I think there's some good questions for individual platforms too, but maybe we can come back to those in the wrap up or dive into them in the breakout. Um, so the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move us into the um, breakouts and um, each of the groups is gonna be um, randomly distributed across domains. Um, and what we're hoping to capture from these breakouts is do a quick round of introductions who's in your group, but then examples of projects or types of projects in your field. Um, and then we'd like to brainstorm some examples for like um, Greg's, uh, what he was just describing, you know, how might we share information across systems? How might we find um, resources about a project? How might we so we're looking for creating these how might we's. We're not looking for specific metadata fields um, or getting to that level of uh, actually implementation. So I'm gonna open up the breakout rooms. Um, you're welcome to come back to the main room if you don't wanna um, participate, but there should be enough folks in all the rooms that um, you can have, a. there'll be enough folks. Um, so I'll do this now. And then... Um, 